Hybrid Cloud Show, Episode 10. I'm Aaron. I'm Gary. I'm Sean. And I'm Shane. Welcome to the show about public cloud, private cloud, and everything in between. Our views here are ours and not those of our employers. So a couple of episodes ago, we talked about Kubernetes and getting started with it. So now I thought it might be interesting to dig a little deeper into those topics and talk about what you do once you've got that Kubernetes cluster. And the first thing I'm interested in knowing about is networking, how to get your traffic into that cluster and around that cluster. So who's going to lead me out with my choices when it comes to networking in a Kubernetes cluster? So generally, when it comes to Kubernetes, if you're trying to get network traffic into your cluster, that's what's called an ingress. And if you're trying to move traffic around like east-west, like around inside of your cluster or to maybe another cluster, that's usually done with a technology called services. It's a resource called service. I know we covered a little bit of this, but when I deploy my Kubernetes cluster, will I normally have networking working out of the box or do I need to make some choices there about what I need to turn on or, or deploy there? Depends if you're doing it to the easy way or the hard way. If you're doing it the hard way, then you have to install what's called a CNI, a cluster network interface. And that basically gives your cluster networking as a whole, the services at least, and some other low end stuff. If you're using something like K3S, or if you're using obviously one of the providers like EKS, then that's all done for you. And so you have nothing to do there. There are kind of three tiers using Kubernetes in general. There are the cluster providers, that's EKS, that's you know AWS, that's Google, that's the people who are hosting and running the cluster for you. If you're doing it yourself on-prem, then that's also going to be you. Then there are the cluster operators. Those are usually your admin, your IT, your sysops, whatever you want to title you want to give them. And they operate at that ingress level. They want to control what comes in and what comes out of the cluster. And then you have your application developers, and those are like the cluster users, and they usually just stick to the services, right? That's the layer they live at. The ingress should be provided for you. If not, or you are the cluster operator, you are the cluster provider, the person actually is running the, the cluster, then you need to install what's called an ingress. And there are several types out there. There's Envoy, there's Nginx, there's Trafic. You just got to pick and choose what fits best for you. If you're using a cloud provider, does that change? Can you could you integrate into a cloud ingress or is it is you have to use those like Nginx or Traffic would integrate into the provider directly? You can use either. So most of the cloud providers have their own one, which has some nice integrations with the cloud. So for example, a while back, AWS had the ALB ingress controller, which was really nice because it meant that when you tried to expose a service in your EKS cluster, it would go and generate an application load balancer for you, which meant that you got all of the Route 53 integration, high availability by default, and everything else. So that was that was quite nice. I think AKS has a very similar thing on Azure. So you can do that, or you can raw dog it and you can deploy your own ingress controller like HA proxy or Nginx or Trafic or something. But then you're kind of the person who's responsible for making sure that that's running on the correct nodes and that it has traffic routing around in the right ways. And is there a distinction there between the ingress and a load balancer, or are they just different names for the same thing? There's not really a distinction. It's just really where you're doing the load balancing. So if you were running HA proxy or something inside your cluster, you would effectively end up with three DNS names pointing at the nodes that HA proxy ingress was running on, and then that would manage the load balancing between pods. If you're using the application load balancer one on EKS, for example, it's going to take all of that management of things like health checks outside of your cluster. So it just depends on what what you're comfortable with working with, I think. One of the interesting things I've found around Kubernetes uh, networking while I've been learning is that for clusters with multiple pods in it, there is a default where everything can connect to everything else, which I thought was quite interesting and a little surprising. I thought it'd be, you can't get access to anything until we say so. And there's a whole idea of using tags to kind of, and labels to, to provide a means to inhibit and allow connections. It's a slightly different paradigm to what I'm used to. So yeah, that's, that's a, an interesting kind of very flexible shift in how you manage networking within a cluster, I thought. 
It depends on what your cluster has set up for it, right? What your cluster operator set up for you. I think by default, you're correct that you can, you know, if you just spin K3S up, then you can just go between namespaces like that. But if you are maybe on production workload, right, at a company, then yeah, they might limit your network traffic by namespace or only certain pods with certain labels can talk to other places and other namespaces. By default, like you are about what I've experienced, it, it, you're shooting, not shooting yourself in the foot, but you're definitely given global everything, which again, by default, it's weird. But yeah, it, it, you as the operator, I assume, would then have to set up the controls you would um, normally expect to have around uh, networks like this. Yeah, you stray into the world of network policies. Say Calico, which is one of the CNIs, has some pretty complicated and advanced network policies that it can do. So you can limit by namespace, tag, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a, a whole nother layer of things to think about, I think. So yeah, I think in this day and age, insecure by default is a little bit of a strange concept when we're pushed so far into everything should be secure by default and locked down unless you allow it. But by default, with Calico, there aren't any real network policies, or if there are, they're pretty permissive. And where do service meshes fit in? So by default, traffic that is between services is not encrypted. That's just HTTP across your pods. And as some people might tell you, that's not really a good thing. Somebody could be listening or snooping in, or maybe a, a malicious pod or something, and it's just not a best security practice. And so service meshes depending on the product, kind of fulfill two roles. The first is that they will run as a sidecar on your pods. If you don't know what a sidecar is, a sidecar is a container that runs alongside your application in a pod. So that one pod might have two or three or four different containers in it, depending on what it needs. So for example, at my job, Every pod I deploy has my application, but it also has a sidecar provided to me by the cluster admins for Itzio, which is a service mesh technology. And that encrypts all my traffic into HTTPS to be sent across to another pod where there's another sidecar that's also running Itzio that knows how to decrypt that traffic and then give it to my pod so they can communicate. It also aids with things like service discovery. Say, if you've got a bunch of microservices running where you want to be able to easily work out where's my message queue or where's my other application that's running, things like Service Mesh can really help with discovering that. They can help with giving that a much easier, more discoverable name, et cetera, et cetera. Say, it's not just about encryption of traffic. It's also about working out those relationships between services and being able to map and discover those more easily. And is that because you can just query something like Istio to find out what the services are? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it requires like add-ons like Istio to, to get that sort of functionality. It's not going to come out of a box. You could probably roll your own, but I wouldn't recommend doing it. Something like Istio exists for a reason. It's pre-built just to get that stuff working for you. And you can obviously put policies in place like Sean's system admin has where you can't just go and expose a service on HTTP. It has to go through that sidecar container. So all that stuff makes it easier. You could go and put like an Nginx sidecar container to proxy the traffic in, in front of all of your services, but it's just a bunch of complexity. If you're going to roll your own, then you can totally do that, but you'll have to hit the Kubernetes API server. So you put up, you know, whatever custom tag you want on your pods, and then you and your application somehow is going to have to reach out to Kubernetes API server, get the tags, and then find out, you know, which pods match to which tags that you are looking for, and then send that off. It's, yeah, use service meshes. Yeah, I've seen things like Sean mentioned there cause real problems with like scaling the Kubernetes control plane in the past, where if you've got applications that are constantly trying to go, where's my message queue? Where's application X? Where's application Y? Where's application C? You can really start hitting the control plane hard. And then if you're running a cloud provider, they have to deal with scaling that. But what you might find is that they only want to scale it so far before they get really upset at you because they're running like huge nodes for the control plane. Or if you're running it yourself, you're going to run into a while the hair that's who. This is interesting. The courses I'm doing on Kubernetes right now, it's all pure raw Kubernetes, no add-ons at all. So I've been hitting like, okay, let's roll our own sort of equivalent to this and finding it a bit weird and clunky. So yeah, glad to see there's some solutions out there. I may depend on you more for more suggestions around what off the shelf make life easier because there's a lot of complexity in there doing it yourself. Yeah, Itzio is the really common one that I see widely deployed among most clusters that I end up looking at. 
the service mesh deals with the internal service inter process or inter service communication. And then you also have your ingress and egress coming into and out of the cluster. Is the CNI just the piece that is dealing with ingress and egress? No, the CNI is dealing with the east-west traffic in the cluster, so inter-process, inter-service, inter-pod communication. The ingress and egress are deployed. Well, certainly the ingress is deployed separately to that. Okay. And so if I'm coming at this from someone who's got, you know, say, Docker containers at home, and I at least understand enough of the way that the networking in that works, that you've got your sort of machine IP mapped to some container in some way through the ways that Docker lets you do that. What's the behind the scenes traffic happening in a Kubernetes cluster? I've got my clusters, I've got a whole lot of replicas of the containers sitting on different physical servers, and then traffic comes in and it's going to have to hit those containers. Where does it go? So if you're on your workstation hitting a service, it's going to hit your ingress controller or some kind of load balancer that you're sitting in front of your ingress controller. So in the AWS world, that would be something like an application load balancer. In your self-deployed Kubernetes world, it would be something like a node that has your ingress controller running on it. So I quite like the distinction that OpenShift used to have for this, where you had dedicated router nodes that did nothing other than ran the CNI and ran the ingress controller. So I knew that if I wanted something to hit my cluster, it went to the IP of one of those three router nodes that hit the ingress controller that was listening on 80 and 443, and then that handled getting the traffic into the pods. So it hits ingress controller, ingress controller then has a bunch of config in it, which makes a decision on which pods it needs to route it to, which ones are healthy and unhealthy. And then the CNI handles the routing of that traffic from whatever Kubernetes node is running the ingress controller into the exposed port on the pod or whatever it is that you've got. The other thing here, if it's not HTTP and HTTPS traffic, is you can just expose a raw port on the host. So that's really commonly done for things like a MySQL DB, where perhaps you haven't got something like a load balancer that you would want to sit in front of it, and you just want, I need to hit MySQL, you can expose like a node port for that. So you can say that port 5000 on my node is hitting the MySQL listener port on this particular pod, and Kubernetes will then natively handle the the ingress into the pod for, say, non-HTTP traffic. I do think there's a mega high port range for node port, though it starts at something bizarrely high like 10,000 and something. Yeah, it's some really high ephemeral port, I think. Okay, so you just said node port. What do you mean by that? So node port would be like in a Docker Compose file where you've got a pod where you know you've got a service listening on, say, port 80, and you want to expose that port to something outside of your Docker host. So you want to, say, go to IP of my Docker host port 30,000, and it puts you to port 80 inside the container. Node port is effectively the Kubernetes term for doing that. I think in my mind, it's the simplest, hackiest way to get access to something because it was the way I was providing access to certain things before I kind of learned a little more about the alternative approaches. Yeah, it's essentially port forwarding as you would do in a router or something. Right, and how should you be doing that instead? It's absolutely fine to do node port if you've got something like a Postgres container running and I've got PG admin on my workstation and I want to access that Postgres instance using PG admin. I could just expose the Postgres instance through a node port and then give my database administrator to pop into PG admin. Sure, here's the IP of the node that your Postgres is running on. Use this IP, this port, and you can connect to it as if it was just running on a server somewhere. But doing all this makes you go around the ingress. You're not actually going through the ingress if you're hitting the node port. That's a very careful consideration. Usually you want to go through your ingress controller because it provides you an extra level of security, auditing, right? You get logging for all the connections to go through. I recommend that. The other two options, if you are going to expose something, is uh, cluster IP, which is by default, I think, what most services do, which means just internal. So pods have an IP assigned to them, and they can all talk to each other by knowing which IP to go to. Nothing's exposed externally. In the other direction, if you do need to expose something and you want it to be static, meaning I'm always going to need this 
I want a static IP. I don't want to have to jump around between different node IPs. Then there's another type of service called load balancer. And that does basically exactly what you think it does. It's a static IP. You can expose a port on it. And then that can always be referenced without going through the instance controller. So that's another route going through that. If you use something like MetaLB, if you're doing something on-prem, you're using MetaLB, then that is how you're going to get access into your cluster, right? You'll expose an English controller over a load balancer port, and that way it's static and the traffic flows through. When you're doing that, are you getting a real mapping to a physical machine, or is it a floating IP that will change depending on the health of the underlying nodes? It's a floating IP, so it's a bit like using something like VRRP, Mm -hmm. if you're familiar with running HA proxy, where you end up with a floating IP that just coexists and it knows which node that is currently active or currently healthy to forward traffic to. So one of the questions I had was, I've been managing a lot of pods and the the networking connection between those pods basically through text files, and it's very kind of tricky to get visibility into what's able to connect to what and how and and what each pod is like, how visible it is. Is there any like add-ons or or nice GUIs that I can use to sort of get a better overall visibility and make it slightly easier to administer these clusters and the networking between them? There's a couple of very quick suggestions that come off the top of my head. The very quick and easy one to deploy that the CNCF provide is Kubernetes dashboard. It's existed forever. It's just a web dashboard that you deploy inside your cluster that gives you visibility over running pods, IPs, what their ingresses are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's really, really easy. You just run it in the cluster, run a kubectl proxy, and then access it on port 8001. The other option, which runs outside the cluster and is just a desktop app that you install and use, which is really nice, is called K8's Lens. So that's just a really nice application. Run it on the desktop, and it can give you really good visibility into exactly what's running on the cluster across multiple clusters. It's sort of like the IDE for Kubernetes, if I had to give it a catchphrase. And how do you connect to that? Is that like it runs locally, you point it at the cluster's API server? And, yeah. And, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Other options are like Rancher, K9S, if you want something that's like a CLI, but I guess what's called TUI, TUI. Yeah. But as far as seeing like traffic flow inside of a cluster, I don't think I know of anything that does that. There must be, but yeah, yeah. It's an interesting <laughs> problem to have. There must be something that allows you to see the traffic across Calico or whatever. I haven't come across it. The closest thing I can think of is if you're using like Tailscale as your sidecar, as your service mesh, um, they have an operator for that. And it does exactly what we said, puts a sidecar, and then all of that will show up on your, your Tailscale dashboard so you can manage it like that. But I don't know if that really scales well. That sounds really interesting. I didn't think of using Tailscale in that way, but that's that's a that might be a nice solution to some home networking challenges I've got. Yeah, that's a real cool way to go and deploy that sidecar container and give everything an IP on a network that you can just access. I've seen that done a few times before, and it's a really, really clean way of doing it. And I guess you get that, like a little bit of visibility from the tail scale dashboard about what you've got and what they're serving as well. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, you could also use tail scale as like a pseudo ingress by doing that as well. Mm. If you run the tail scale DNS and the tail scale proxy stuff, that's a really nice way of getting getting traffic into pods. I like it. Don't understand that and just shove tail scale in there. That's my usual approach to things. <laughs> <laughs> so say I've got my application and I've got multiple replicas of it. And now I want to have traffic come in and hit those things. What do I do? So you need some kind of CNI running in the cluster, which is the thing that's going to handle the east-west traffic, give the pods IP addresses, make sure that the cluster understands how to route traffic around. You're going to need to decide if you want to use an ingress controller or if you want to do some kind of node port exposure, which we don't really recommend apart from in a few edge cases. Your cluster probably comes with a CNI. It might come with an ingress controller. If it comes with either, I'd suggest probably using those. If it doesn't come with an ingress controller, think about if you want to use one that nicely integrates with a cloud provider or use something that you're familiar with. So for me, when I first started out, that was HA proxy because I'd already deployed that at scale. Then decide where that ingress controller is going to run. Are you going to run that in all nodes across your cluster and expose that as some kind of load balancer service? 
Or are you going to run that on a dedicated set of router nodes and then handle health checking separately through a DNS health check or something? Once you've done that, that's kind of it. That should be enough to send an HTTP request and get it through to a pod running in the cluster. For those of you out there who are running K3S, you already have all that out of the box. Your load balancer technology is called Clipper. Your English controller is called Trafic. And if you start up without any flags, you get all that out of the box. If you want to disable them, then you have to go to your actual system D files and add the flags to disable those features. And there's documentation on how to do that. Right, well, we better wrap it up. Before we do, just a quick thank you to those people who support us on PayPal and Patreon. If you would like to join those people, you can go to hybridcloudshow.com slash support, where for various amounts, you can get an ad-free feed of either just this show or all the late-night Linux family shows. And sometimes you receive episodes early. If you know anyone who might be interested in this show, please do pass on the link. We're still trying to build the audience. And if you have any questions or feedback, please send them in to show at hybridcloudshow.com. We'll be back in two weeks. Until then, I've been Aaron. I've been Gary. I've been Sean. And I've been Shane. See you later.